OK, delighted to say that we have got Munster and Ireland back row CJ Stander with us. How are you getting on, CJ? Hi, yeah, not too bad. Um, training hard, um, getting stuck into pre-season again after uh, a few years of uh, we haven't had a proper pre-season, so it's going well. Very good. So you're promoting the fact this week that Hellbent Borobors are securing a contract with Aldi. Uh, it's going to be available in stores all around Ireland. Uh, so what is Hellbent, but more importantly, what is Borobors? And I presume I've absolutely destroyed the pronunciation of that word. Well, actually, not too bad. Um, yeah, it's called uh, Burevors. You're not okay. too bad. You need to say it a very aggressive way, you know, the proper South African way if you speak uh, Afrikaans. But uh, yeah, so Albent um, is a company started by Louis Ludic and Skal van der Merwe, and um, we uh, we joined up and uh, we started um, producing meat products. Our main thing is Burevors. It's actually just sausage, uh, beef sausage that is um, it's a high source of protein. Very healthy, not a lot of fat in it, um, and uh, we're making other products like uh, hamburger patties, uh, meatballs. Um, yeah, so those are three three main things. And um, the biggest thing for us was just to uh, uh, we made it for uh, well, Skalk anyway made it up north for a few friends, and uh, they actually enjoyed it. So we thought that we might uh, just get, see if we can sell some of it. And um, yeah, Aldi gave us a great opportunity with uh, with Aldi to get on the shelves um, for the competition we won for, for a year, you know, so um, it's, been, it's been a great success so far and we're actually looking forward to seeing where this can go. You're obviously a bit of a meat aficionado. When you moved to Ireland, are you impressed or are you disappointed by the quality of our meat here? No, I think the meat is uh, exceptional. Um, I think it's some of the best beef I've ever, especially while working with beef, is some of the best beef with, um, I've had in, uh, in my life, you know, so our main thing is was to uh, produce locally, you know, get um, Irish beef. And the only thing we, we, we outsource from South Africa is the spice um, that is in the meat and the sausages. And uh, we were trying to mix the two uh, cultures and the, and the quality of the products we got here, the meat, and uh, get it out there so we can, um, yeah, get, get the people behind it and actually um, uh, taste and see what we grew up with as kids. Uh, so talk to us a, a little bit uh, about South Africa then. You've been down there during lockdown. Yeah, uh, I was in uh, just before lockdown. We as a family decided that we wanted to get back uh, closer to our family and just in case something happened, uh, luckily nothing uh, close to us happened, touch wood, and we just wanted to be close to them. So yeah, we, we went down there and had a great six weeks on the farm. Uh, I could put, it, uh, put my hand to the farming again and I quite enjoyed that and um, I spent some time with my family-in-law, so it was great. Um, yeah, well, except for the COVID, um, and for us, it worked out quite well. We could uh, spend some time with the family, um, something that we didn't really get in the last so eight years, um, good family time, you know, and uh, we have the little girl, and she could spend time with the grandparents, so that was, uh, that was amazing to see her grow and them um, fall in love with her. Which is more stressful for you uh, and stressful on the body, a pre-season training session at Munster or a day on the Stander Farm down in South Africa? No, surely the farm. Um, mm. I just got back to pre-season and um, I, actually, I actually enjoy it thoroughly, you know, uh, putting in some hard work again. And especially now with the COVID, with the regulations, uh, training is short and sharp. Um, I'm home at sometimes around 11. And, uh, I mean, <laughs> on the farm, I woke up at 5 and went to bed at 11 at night. So, it's not a lot of rest. And uh, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot to ask for you on the day on the farm in South Africa. <laughs> uh, what are you doing on the farm down there then that has you up at 5 and in bed at 11? That's that's uh, pretty hefty labor. Yeah, so we uh, produce uh, vegetables. Uh, that was That's one of our main main uh, ranches but we also have a dairy so uh, a normal day starts with uh, collecting the cows at five and starting to milk them um, till around seven half past seven and then back into the fields on the farm uh, for the vegetable side of it and then finish that around four o'clock back to the dairy and uh, yeah that process just goes on for the, every day uh, the whole year non-stop seven days a week so um, I feel that my brother and my dad actually they work they work hard. They, they they can say they work hard. How does that feel for you mentally then to not be thinking about rugby for that period of time? Granted, the body is working hard, but 
the start of this season, CJ, was Japan. It was the Rugby World Cup. It feels like years and years and years ago at this point. But I'd assume on a mental level, having that break, being able to plug out from thinking about rugby all the time was a huge boost to you. Yeah, mentally it was uh, it was it was massive. You know, I think if you're um, what happens with um, playing international um, and for your club, you play week in and week out. You know, you never get a break where you can actually switch off because normally you get your four or five weeks off, and your first two weeks is um, just taken to travelling and seeing family. For me, anyway, and then it's just back into to yeah work you have to do. You know, so. Um, I took a proper four weeks off, uh, something I haven't done in a long time. Mentally, it was important for me just to reset the mind. And then physically, my body um, needed a break, even if I wanted it or not. You know, uh, the small niggles that I've been coming along with since 2017, 2018, you know, I could really heal up and my body return to its natural shape again, you know. So um, I think it's ready to take a bang again for the next few years. You mean returning to its natural shape in terms of your a clean bill of health, or, or do you mean that you've like fluctuated weight, or, or what is the, the natural shape you refer to there? No, it's just uh, being able to uh, walk around, um, feeling 100%, you know, get out of bed and not uh, worried if the back's going to be tight or something's going to be tight, you know, and walk up straight, you know. Um, that is that is one of my one of my main things. <laughs> How many days do you wake up with uh, with that worry that you might not be able to walk straight? Um, no, I, in the last few years, I've been uh, quite on top of my uh, rehab. and um, I've actually started doing a lot of um, reformer Pilates work to just keep the body straight and mobile, you know. But for me, the biggest thing is just the back tightening up every morning, you know. And um, uh, Like that was before, I say, a year ago. That would be every morning, you know, just waking up and not sure if, my back's going to be stiff or not, and if I'm going to be able to walk up straight firstly and then uh, be able to train 100%, you know, because that's what I personally want to do is train 100% every week and then make sure I'm ready for the weekend. So that was the main, that was a big, big thing for me uh, a few years ago, but now, last few years, it's been, the last year anyway, it's been, I've been on the good side of the stiffness and the aches. Right, okay. Uh, just back on that, that mental level of things then. Does it feel good for you to have had the opportunity to step out of the spotlight as well over the, the past few months? Because I guess being a, an Irish international, there is quite an amount of attention on the team. It was mid-Six Nations that coronavirus hits this country. It is in the middle of one of the times of the year where you are going to be on the back pages of the newspapers. The, the Six Nations wasn't going amazingly well. There were there were some up points for sure. The England game, perhaps uh, the low point of this year, Six Nations. Was it good to not have that attention on you for a little while? Yeah, it's uh, it's something that I could uh, control. You know, it's not just um, uh, out there, everything um, sports-wise on the back page. You just said it, and um, it, it yeah, it was it was great. You know, I think biggest thing for me is um, not checking my phone the whole time. My screen time went down, um, and um, I could be I, on the farm. I could be. There was no one came in because of the virus, you know. I could be um, inconspicuous for, for weeks on weeks, you know. So it was actually, uh, we flew back and I finished my quarantine. It was actually, uh, when I was back in Limerick, it was actually weird when someone came up and asked for an autograph and pictures. I, uh, it felt like um, the first time again almost, you know. So it's good to um, take that break as well, you know. Um, I think it's a thing that happens with the game and it is important as well, uh, I think. Um, as as rugby players and as, as sports people, that you get put on a pedestal and 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 um, you have to um, that, that happens, you know, and you have to uh, take that with the game. You know, and it's great, you know. I mean, it's good to uh, be someone's role model, hopefully, or just someone that someone can look up to, or someone that someone enjoys seeing, you know. And uh, that happens with the game. And if I can make it a uh, child's day, then that's awesome. But uh, it was good to uh, be in form, just being myself and uh, yeah. wearing old dirty clothes for <laughs> two days in a row and do my thing, you know. Uh, can I ask you then, just to, you mentioned trying to cut down on your screen time then. Like, I presume as, as somebody who plays at an international level test rugby, that is something that you really have to be careful of because you can turn on Twitter one day and anybody can be in touch with you abusing you about your performance or anything like that. Is that something that you've been conscious of in recent times, trying to cut down on not what you're putting out and actually typing into your phone, but also what you're reading and what's coming in? 
Yeah, I think it's uh, the mind is the thing that as good as you train it or try to train it, you know, it's going to look for uh, negative stuff. doesn't matter what platform you use. Um, you always want to see what people think of you for some reason. I don't know. That's just a, a human being way, I think, of or these days anyway, of looking at stuff, you know. So it is important to uh, not guard yourself from things like that. But I feel if I don't go look for it, then uh, it's probably gonna, not going to follow me. It's going to be out there. But, uh, yeah, I think you surely need to make sure that if you do something or say something that um, you do it in the right way, in the right manner, and um, surely you have your views and your opinions and you want to share stuff with people, but um, you need to make sure you do it in the right way because um, people are going to have opinions and that is fair. Everyone has an opinion. And uh, the biggest thing is you need, if you want to use it and put it out there, you need to be able to uh, handle what comes your way, mm. good or bad. Well, has there ever been a period in your career when you haven't been able to handle that when the criticism would get you down? Um, I've probably when I was a lot younger. I think uh, over the years, certain situations um, grow, um, shaped me into um, or helped me grow in, in in that perspective. You know, with working with criticism and dealing with it. You know, so. Um, I've I've been disappointed with stuff that um, has been said or been said towards my way, but um, dealing with it, you know, it's like it is an old saying. It's like water off a duck's back. You can't let that those stuff um, sink in because it's it gets rooted and then problems start occurring in that spot, you know. So you need to. Uh, for me, again, I if I if I say something or I do something, then I take the consequences good or bad and i uh if i put it out there that i make sure that i think about what i'm what i'm doing and if what's the conscious gonna conscious gonna be mm. uh, you've mentioned that you're back in training with monster over the last few weeks cj how has that been i, I presume that there's no contact yet or, or is that starting to come back in now no it's been great you know being back um i think it's like any a uh, person going back to any job, you actually start missing uh, doing your thing, you know, your routine. For me, anyway, I think as rugby players, we like uh, having a routine. So it's been great being back in the gym. Um, the social distancing and all the rules are, are out there, you know. We, are, I must say, it's been unbelievable um, the stuff we had to do and, and, and what's, put, what's been put out there and how we follow it, you know, it's been great from. Uh, players, coaches, and all backroom staff. So, yeah, there's um, there's not a lot of contact. There isn't contact. We, we're using bags, and we're training in small groups, I think, just to uh, make sure we uh, confine if there's an outbreak or if someone gets sick. But um, I've been tested twice now already, so uh, I think they're making really sure that if we do it, we do it right, because I think that's the main way to do it. And I think it is important to keep everyone around you safe as well. Um, it's not just about me. It's about everyone Staying safe and make sure I don't really infect someone if if I if I get um, the coronavirus or same way from someone else. Sure, hey, it's going to be a very interesting few months for Munster. It's going into this season, there was always going to be a betting in period with some of the new coaches, with Graham Roundtree, with Stephen Larkham. They've now got a, a few months to, I guess, consider their game plan, get more used to, to their setting, and, and perhaps it'll feel like a new season for them. Then you've got the new personnel additions, not least the South Africans, Orji Sneem and, and Damien de Allende. Do you feel that Munster are, because of those reasons, in, in a really, really good position to attack the second half of the season? Yeah, I think it's, um, I think it's through any club's um, uh, advantage, you know, to at uh, this break and really reflect on what you've done this year. But I think for us, uh, as you just mentioned today, we had time. I think as a coaching staff and as players to to see what we can improve and and where we can go on. And especially with, the, as you just said, with the new additions, coaches wise, they could see their plan and 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 they have a nice taste now of what pl uh, players they have to. Um, what they have to work with and, and what they can uh, do in the competition. And the players we got is world class. I mean, uh, not everyone walk, walks around in the world with the World Cup medal. And uh, especially with uh, the two, uh, well, RG mentioned them and, and Damien, but then uh, Roman, you know, and, and Matt coming in as well as guys who's worked with the championship teams. And um, I think the experience they bring in is, is going to add value to the team and the squad for sure. Um, and I think. 
I think a very obvious thing is the academy coming through for us, um, especially last year and this year. We've got five guys coming into the system who's fitted in like a glove, and I'm actually looking forward to see what they can do and um, to see what's what's gonna what's gonna hold in. What the season's gonna hold in for them this year. Mm. Yeah, it's gonna be a very interesting few months. It has been a very interesting few months for numerous reasons, and I need to ask you as well, CJ. Like, because one of the big stories over the course of the lockdown has been surrounding your teammate James Cronin, uh, who served a one-month ban for testing positive for prednisolone and prednisone. We can stay away from the specifics of that case. I just want to ask you if there's been a conversation had with you as a player, with your teammates uh, after something like this about the responsibility, I guess, that is on players to ensure that they are entering the field as clean as possible. Have those conversations happened over the last couple of months? Um, yeah, I think James's thing is his thing. You know, I think it's been handled. Um, I think the, the system has taken its course and I think it's handled quite well. I think as a player, um, the conversations happen. Um, we actually have a, um open conversation. I think all the provinces with Irish rugby as well and Munster, there's a we get a lot of education coming our way, you know, with the anti-doping. And that's the thing that Irish rugby and Munster, I know that's been top of that of those things in the last few years, you know. So, um, yeah, we get the education and it's and it's uh, it's every few months, you know. So, um, especially in the last few few weeks, there's been conversations and I think everyone understands what's um, wanted from them and what they need to bring, to, uh, what they need to bring to the game. For sure. I guess the question I would have is, if you were ever to, to get a prescription yourself, uh, is there a, a clear kind of chain of command about who you need to ask before you go into a pharmacy and how much are those rules and that advice, how much is all that heightened after what's happened over the last little while? Yeah, I think um, for me personally is, uh, I think, talk to the doctor and um, things get uh, get told to you and um, you, you go get your things and you make sure it's your, um, it, 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 it's your things, you know, it's, uh, but uh, I mean, it's a process that we've all been through. Um, it's yeah, it's probably it's probably going to be heightened, but um, it's not that there's an issue around that. Mm. The independent judicial officer in this case said that uh, Cronin must shoulder some fault uh, for the error, despite, of course, all all the the official reasons, decisions saying that it was obviously accidental. Uh, is that something that you always need to bear in mind? The the fact that there will always be some fault, regardless of something being an accidental breach of protocol. Um, I think yeah, well, it's just um, it is something you need to look after as an athlete, especially because you're. Um, it is um, a thing that is part of the game, and you need to make sure that um, what you get into your system is something that um, you yeah you want to you can control. You know, so um, yeah, I think it's a right way to right way to do it, and um, I think. Um, the stuff with uh, James has been handled in the right manner, and um, he's a great man, and uh, it's it's uh, yeah, well, it's been handled. Yeah, we it, it, and like I mean, we we won't get into the specifics of that case, but one of the other cases that we've seen over the last little while has been the resultant ban for Chile boy Ralapelli, who's been banned for eight years. It's one of two big cases that we're going to see over the next little while. We're going to have the Dianti case, uh, which I'm sure you're aware, with, uh, aware of as well. The decision is on the way there. It was supposed to happen before coronavirus. I'm sure you'll also remember that was the big talking point going into uh, the Rugby World Cup last year. I can remember you were asked about it at a press conference as well because of your South African connections. And these are all individual cases, CJ. But I'm, I'm just very interested to just get your take on this again about whether or not South African rugby have questions to answer about doping in their country when it comes to rugby? Uh, luckily, I'm in Ireland, so uh, <laughs> I think uh, if you talk to another South African who plays in there, you can, uh, you can ask that question. For sure. Uh, I guess uh, the point is that you would have grown up in the culture there and you obviously announced yourself on the stage at Craven Week, which obviously has had a, a number of fingers pointed at it over the last few years. So you'll be familiar with the culture in South Africa. So I'm basically asking, is it unfair of me to say that there is something culturally wrong in South Africa when it comes to cheating? Um, well, you're throwing me down a rabbit hole, you know, but... Uh... I, I think if you, yeah, you're gonna, you're gonna, if you say the culture is a cheating culture, then I think if you talk to the wrong people, you're gonna be in trouble. And I'll leave it there. <laughs>
yeah, I, I guess, sorry, but that's obviously too strong. And I, I guess that's a, a little bit hyperbole on my point. It's just y- y- the figures at Craven Week, I guess if we're just going to use your connection to South Africa, have been fairly stark down through the years. You know, six doping offences in 2018, three tests that tested positive the year before, four the year before, five the year before that. There is always uh, going to be big figures from this tournament. And that, that is where the, the alarm bells ring. But perhaps it's a, a sports thing rather than a South African sports thing. And uh, I'm just curious on, on your opinion on that, that are we too quick to, to look at South Africa? Um, uh, yeah. I think it's, it's just, look, it's a, it's a, it's a difficult uh, conversation to have. You know, I think it's, mm. it is there and it's, um, I think as, uh, as players, it's sort of, it's their decision if 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 someone wants to um, uh, like if someone wants to dope, you know. So yeah, I think um, the the figures are there, you know. It's not going to lie. So I don't know if if how I know in Ireland the, the testing is quite um, strict, you know, and it's a lot. I've been tested multiple times just in the Six Nations. I mean, it was four or five times, um, you know. So that 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 happens. So I think. Um, yeah, I think the testing has been done, and I think a few guys, especially in South Africa, has been caught. But it's um, it's luckily it's been done, and people have have been uh, <laughs> got into trouble about it. And yeah, that's it. Yeah, and it'll be interesting to see what happens. And you're right, it is a difficult conversation to have, but it is an important one to have. Uh, just kind of like a, a final one on that, which kind of ties this all together. Uh, like you, you mentioned that the scenario that you've had in the past about waking up in the morning with a pain in your back and uh, not being able to move, it's something that I'd imagine a lot of rugby players have, especially in the modern game. There's been a lot of talk in the past about painkiller use in rugby. How careful do you need to be about painkiller use and how informed do you need to be? Because I'd imagine you wake up the morning after a game and the temptation is there and the temptation to use it during a game and, and to get uh, painkilling injections, I'm sure, is huge as well. Um, yeah, me personally, I don't like them. Uh, I like the feeling I uh, get from them, you know, so I don't really use a lot. Um, I, I can't... Uh, can't uh, if if I if I have a sore back or a sore something I'll try a normal way you know jump in a hot bath or something like that so it's it's, uh, it's not it's probably easier to go, go that route but me personally no. Fair enough. Uh, listen, CJ, you've been great with your time. Really appreciate it. And just another reminder: Hellbent Burgers. They're available in Aldi all around the country over the next little while. So uh, make sure to get uh, your chops stuck into them. CJ Stander, a pleasure. Thanks. Thank you very much, Josh.